Please turn in your Bibles in the Old Testament to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. We're in a series in the, on the minor prophets, which, is, which a lot of people skip over. Uh, and maybe that's because they're called minor. And you think, how important could they be? They're called minor. And then you also get into them and you realize they're kind of difficult in, in some places to understand. But it's like I explained a couple of weeks ago. They're not called minor because they're unimportant. They're called minor because they're short. Which, to be honest, they get in, they state their case, they wrap up their case, and boom, they're done. They're short. And some of you are saying, I wish your sermons were a little bit more minor, you know. Well, these 12 books are short, but they really are important. Because they describe what they could do to bring about restoration after things have gone so wrong. And that's really good news for us because some of our lives have gone pretty wrong. So these books gives us some instructions on how it got that way. And what we can do about it now that we're in that condition. Now, Joel's book is the second in the Minor Prophets. And Joel's actually one of the earliest recorded prophets. Folks, you need to understand this. Your Bible is not arranged chronologically. Joel lived and prophesied early in Israel's history. A little bit after Solomon, but before the exile. They say... Joel was probably a student of Elijah and Elisha. Joel's book was written during a time when a lot of things had gone wrong in Israel. They had a whole bunch of really bad leaders. They just suffered through a national plague. There was civil unrest. There were economic problems. The stock market was down. Foreign trade was low. National confidence it didn't exist. Almost Everybody believed their country was headed in the wrong direction. Does any of this sound familiar? And so Joe writes to diagnose the problem, and he tells them they only have one real problem. They think a bunch of things are wrong, but Joel says, actually, there's just one thing that's wrong. In fact, that book, this book reminds me of a story I heard about the guy who went to his doctor and he complained. He said, everything in my body hurts. The doctor said, show me. And the guy pointed to his shoulder and he said, see this shoulder? It hurts. It hurts here. Then he pointed to his stomach and he said, it hurts right here. And then he pointed to his head and he said, it hurts here. And then he pointed to his leg and he said, it hurts here. And the doctor says, you idiot, you have a dislocated finger. <laughs> see, many times in our lives, we feel like a whole bunch of things are wrong when it's actually only one thing wrong. This book is short, three chapters. We're going to try to go through it this morning. The first one, and it's not divided actually by chapters so much, but we're going to start in verse 4 of chapter 1. I'm not going to read every verse, just a couple of them, and go through chapter 2 and verse 5. It's called the plague. 1 4 says, after, cutting the, after the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locust took what was left. And after then came the hopping locust. And the stripping locust, too. Now, most of you have probably seen a locust before. They look like a grasshopper on steroids. They really do. They're, they're pretty long. But thankfully, we've never experienced this kind of a plague. We have a record of a locust plague that occurred in the region of Palestine around the year 1915. And observers of that event said that in March of that year, swarms of locusts just appeared in the sky. They came from the northeast in clouds. Think about this, that the locusts were so thick, you couldn't even see the sun. Immediately, these locusts began to dig holes in the soil about four inches deep and about a half an inch wide, depositing into each hole about 100 eggs. And the way they lay eggs is creepy. They are neatly formed in cones about one inch long and about as thick as a pencil. And these holes were literally everywhere across the landscape of Israel. About 70,000 eggs would be concentrated in the single square yard of soil. And these little patches would cover the ground for miles and miles and miles. And after a few weeks, the young locusts hatched. And when they did, they resembled large ants. 
They hadn't formed wings yet, so they would just hop around the ground like fleas. They would cover between four and 600 feet a day, devouring any and all vegetation in their path. And as they grew, they developed the ability to jump, at which point their, their range got higher and they would scour trees and vines. And a few weeks later, they would develop wings and they would swarm over the areas and they devour and they would destroy any plant that was left in it. And folks, they say the sound of their swarms was terrifying. Witnesses said that within a few days, there was literally nothing left that was living plant-wise in the region. They would even eat the bark off the trees. As they get more desperate for food, catch this, they swarm into houses eating food and clothes and fabric and wood. They are kind of like high school boys at a pizza party. They literally leave no nothing behind, okay? And Joel, here it is, the prophet Joel is using this locust plague as both an illustration of their sin and also as a warning of God's future judgment on their sin. Let's look at the illustration aspect. See, like the locust plague, the devastating power of sin, it's total. It gradually destroys everything in its path. Folks, the laws God gave us are life. His commandments and rule in our lives lead to our furnishing, flourishing. I want to tell you something. If you follow what God says to do in this book, you're going to flourish. That doesn't mean that you're going to be wealthy. It doesn't mean you're going to be healthy. Okay. It means you're going to be flourishing. And we see this illustrated in the creation account. When God created the earth, it began as a dark, shapeless, chaotic ma mass. Genesis 1-2 says that God's word then spoke into that chaos and it brought life and beauty out of it and order. And God could have created, God could have created it beautifully, but he didn't do it that way because he was trying to illustrate for us what God's words coming into our lives would be like. Into the dark, disorganized, chaotic mess of lives, God's word speaks and out of that comes light and life and order and beauty. Sin, by contrast, unravels creation and plunges our life back into darkness. And God's judgment often illustrates that. Folks, usually God's judgment are just creation unraveling. For instance, the 10 plagues. He was trying to demonstrate to Pharaoh and to Egypt what the rebellion was doing to themselves and to creation. The Nile turns to blood, which causes the frogs to come out. The frogs bring the gnats. The gnats bring the disease. The disease brings the boil. It's just creation unraveling right before their eyes. And we're going to see that same kind of picture here again with the locusts. Our lives unravel and we're destroyed as we pursue this self-centered lifestyle. I've used this before, but it gives you the point. You'll understand this. The way that sin works is the same way they try to kill the wolf up in Alaska. Up there, the wolves kill the seals. So when somebody wants to get rid of a wolf, they will, they will take a really sharp two-edged knife. They will dip it in seal's blood. They'll let the blood around it, uh, freeze around it. Then they will do that several times until layers of seal's blood now coat this blade. And then they'll bury that blade up to the handle so that only the blade itself is sticking out. Then a wolf comes along and he gets a scent of the seal's blood and he goes over to it and he begins to lick this blade. He becomes intoxicated with the seal's blood. And as he does that, his tongue gets numb from the cold. And by the time he gets down to where the blade is exposed, he has no more feeling in his tongue. And he begins to cut his tongue until the blood that is now spilling out of his mouth is no longer the seal's blood. It's his blood. And he doesn't realize it, but he destroyed himself. Folks, that's how sin works. You might think, 
pornography or flirtation or doing things your way instead of God's way is not really causing that much harm, but it is numbing your soul to the devastating effects that sin is going to have in you. And that is what this locust plague is an illustration of the consuming destructive power of sin. But folks, it's not just an illustration. It's also a warning of coming judgment. And by the way, that coming judgment is much more terrible than the locust. Joel says that unless Israel wakes up, God is going to send the armies of Babylon into Israel like a horde of locusts. So you notice that for the next two chapters, he's going to describe this coming invasion of Babylon if Israel doesn't change their ways. And he's going to describe the coming invasion as a locust horde. I'm going to read a few verses from chapter 1 and a few from chapter 2. Listen to this. It starts in verse 5. For a nation has come up against my land, powerful and beyond number. Its teeth are like lion's teeth. It's laid waste my vine and splittered my fig tree. It's stripped off their bark and thrown it down. Their branches are made white. The fields are destroyed before them. The ground mourns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. And behind them, a desperate wilderness. And nothing escapes them. And with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of mountains like the crackling of a flame devouring the stubble. What you are seeing there is God saying, your sin causes this kind of destruction in your life. I sent the locust as an illustration of that. And if you don't wake up, there's going to be a worse one that comes, the armies of Babylon. And what you're seeing there is what theologians call the passive and the active dimensions of the wrath of God and how they work together. For instance, the passive wrath of God is God basically just allowing us to suffer the natural consequences of our sin. God says, okay, that's what you chose. I'll let you experience that. But there's the active wrath of God. That's the lightning bolt of judgment from heaven. And what you see in stories like this one is that the passive and the active wrath of God work together. And the active wrath of God is usually just an affirmation of or an extension of his passive wrath. It's simply God affirming to you. This is the choice that you've already made for yourself. Let me give you a few quick examples. <clears throat> Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and God cast them out of his presence? But do you remember what happened before God cast them out of his presence? They'd already chosen to hide themselves from God's presence. So God's active wrath casting them out of his presence was simply an affirmation of what they'd already chosen for themselves. Go back to the 10 plagues. Scripture says that God's judgment of Pharaoh was to harden his heart so that he would not believe. But folk, that was only after Pharaoh had hardened his own heart several different times. God was affirming and solidifying the choice Pharaoh had already made. In fact, the way Jesus describes hell itself, which is the ultimate display of the wrath of God, shows it to be an extension of his passive wrath. Sometimes we miss that because the Jewish metaphors that Jesus uses to describe hell can be so unfamiliar to us. He says, hell will be a place where the worm does not die. Folks, that's an image of a conscience that is being continually eaten away by guilt and regret and shame. Jesus said that hell is a place of outer darkness. Folks, darkness to the Jewish people represented the total absence of God and all his goodness. He said it's a place of the gnashing of teeth. That was a Jewish image that meant, that meant self-condemnation and self-loathing. It's a place of fire. Fire represented the ultimate agony of God's displeasure. Folks, hell in many ways is the full fruition of us telling God to get out of our lives and God saying, okay, I will. It's like C.S. Lewis used to say, in the end, we either say to God, thy will be done, or he says to us, 
your will be done. Lewis also said, sin is like cancer. It never stops growing. As long as you're alive, it will keep growing until it consumes the host. Sin is like that. He says there's a lot of things in your soul that probably you wouldn't need to worry about if you were only around for 70 or 80 years. But scripture says that God created you to live forever, either in heaven or in hell. And he says, so what is it like when selfishness and jealousy and unchecked lust and materialism, what are those things like when they've grown unchecked in you for a million years? He said, hell is exactly the technical term for what that state would be. In other words, God doesn't destroy, sin destroys. And when you understand that, you'll, th- you'll start to see earthly experiences of God's judgment, like this plague of locusts. You'll start to see them as expressions of God's mercy, because God is trying to let you see where sin is taking you before it's too late. <clears throat> can't compete with that I don't think folks any experience of the painful consequences of our sin before it's too late is God in mercy and in love trying to wake us up he's not trying to pay us back for our sin he's trying to bring us back from our sin as a way to illustrate this I I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, but it was back in 2015, a big time Christian leader got exposed in the Ashley Madison scandal. Now, Ashley Madison was this website that facilitated adulterous relationships. And what happened was their site got hacked and all these people's names came out and there was this powerful or well-known a preacher and Christian teacher on that site and people's identities were no longer hidden and this national leader of a national ministry publicly humiliated and his board asked him to step down they removed him from his ministry and five or six months later he wrote when this thing happened and I was exposed I thought the judgment of God against me was unusually harsh he said it was one night In a moment of weakness, he said, I just signed up. No one contacted me. I never contacted anybody else. I never met anybody. I never followed through with it. It was just a moment of weakness when I was just kind of living out this fantasy. And he said, now I get publicly exposed and humiliated. He said, I lose my ministry. I thought of it as unusually harsh as a demonstration of God's judgment. And he said, six months later, I see it as one of the greatest acts of God's mercy he's ever given to me. He said, because here's what would have happened had it not gone down that way. He said, I would have said a quick prayer of repentance and just swept it under the rug. Losing my ministry was bad, he said, but losing my marriage would have been much much worse. And worse than that would have been losing my soul from never having repented. It was painful, he said, and I didn't like it, but God used it to wake me up. You see, what God does in his mercy is he allows you to taste some of the consequences of sin, and it is painful, and it feels like locust, but God in his mercy is trying to wake you up. Is something like that happening in your life right now? Maybe you feel like the locusts are eating away at every part of your life. Maybe you're trying to to save money but stuff keeps breaking down or maybe you're trying to get better in your marriage but new issues of conflict just keep cropping up maybe you keep trying new strategies to be happy but they don't make you happy folks if you have to spend money every day to get happy that means nothing solid on the inside if you're constantly have to find an escape from real life to be happy like shopping or tv or porn or a hobby or drinking that means something is rotten on the inside god is trying to wake you up folks no new strategy is going to fix you and that's because the source of the problem is not found in the horizontal it's in the vertical There's not a lot of things wrong. There's one thing wrong. And here's the good news and the bad news. 
God has more locusts than you have solutions. So you need to quit pursuing the solutions and deal with the one thing that is actually wrong. In order for God to bring you to your senses, he has to bring you to the end of yourself. For some of you, he's been calling out to you for years, but you haven't been ready to listen yet because you haven't come to the end of yourself. In order for God to make you new, he's got to rip out the old. He has to tear you down. See, a lot of people don't want real change. They just want God to fix that one area in their life that's wrong. So they want God to slap a new moral coat of paint on their life. They want God to scrub away the rust. But here's the thing. God doesn't just want to help you polish up the old. He wants to make you a brand new person. You don't come to him and say, help me to turn over a new leaf. He wants to give you a whole new life. I want to give you a long quote from C.S. Lewis uh, from his book, Mere Christianity. He says this, many people come to God because they realize their house has broken down and they need God to fix it. And at first you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those jobs needed doing. And so you're not surprised. But then he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense to you. And you wonder, what's he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. Erecting a new wing over here or putting on an extra floor over there. Running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. Folks, you might be happy with little changes to that little cottage of your life. But God's got so much more for you. You might be just fine with that shag carpet in the living room. But God has so much more for you than you ever had for yourself. And sometimes in order to give that, give, for you to give that up, he's got to send locusts in your life to wake you up. Is there something in your life that you've been asking God to take away? You've been saying to God every day, every year, God, fix this. God, repair that. But instead, through it, God is trying to send a warning to you. Wake up! That's what God was doing to Israel with this locust plague. So what does God want? Chapter 2 and verse 12 says, and 13, Yet even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Folks, what he's describing here is repentance. Repentance. See, the words with all your heart and fasting and weeping and mourning, he's, a descri he's describing repentance that comes from a broken heart, not just a bent will, but a heart that is heartbroken over what sin did to my God. Because that's the only kind of repentance that really works. Folks, what bothers me about my sin is that it caused some painful circumstances or it caused me uh, to be embarrassed. And when that's all that bothers me about my sin or it caused me to feel guilty or ashamed, then my resolutions to change are short-lived. But in those areas where my heart has been broken over how I hurt God and how I drove his presence from my life, those are the areas of repentance that have really changed me. He talks about fasting. Folks, I want to tell you something. I see too many people that are Christians treat fasting like it earns God's favor. Almost like it's a way of inflicting punishment on yourself where God will say, he's really hurting himself with that hunger, so I'm for going to forgive his sin. A couple of weeks ago, Muslims around the world just finished up Ramadan. Um, that's a month where they will all fast from dawn till dusk. And if you ask them, what is the motive for your fast? They will explain, this is a way of getting forgiveness for our sins and getting the favor of God in our lives. Sad to know, I know Christians who think the same way. I'm going to fast to earn God's approval. Folks, I want to tell you something. We do not earn forgiveness. 
It's given to us because, not because we put ourselves through something horrible, but because Jesus put himself on the cross. Fasting for the Christian is not an attempt to earn God's favor. God gave us that in Christ. Fasting for the Christian is an expression of longing for the God who has given us his favor already. In a fast, you say, God, I need your presence and I need your power in my life. I need your love to throw through my life. I need it in my family. I need it in my kids. I need it in our church. And I'm heartbroken. That I don't have it. Things are not okay. And what I need, God, is I not a better marriage or a little more financial help or a new boss for this person or for this person to leave me alone. What I need is your presence and I need your power in the center of my life. And I want that even more than I want food from my belly. Or you cry out to God and you say, God... I'm not okay with my kids not following Jesus, and I want your presence and your power in their lives more than food, and I'm expressing that to you. Or when we as a church say, I'm not okay with the amount of people in our community who don't know Jesus, and I'm not okay with the tragic amount of people around the globe who have yet to even hear about Jesus, and God, we need your presence and your power and your love in those things more than food. God's presence and power grow through repentance that flows out of our love for him. Folks, if you've fallen out of love with God, you need to go back. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the book of Hosea. And remember the heavenly husband who came for you, the unfaithful one who came to you again and again and again and finally bought you at a price. It is in light of the love for, of God for you that the love of God grows in you. First John four nineteen says, "We love because He first loved us." Joel two thirteen, "Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and mercy, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster." Folks, every inch of growth in your Christian life comes from being aware of the greatness of the love of God for you. You will only learn to repent of your sin. And the more you, uh, when you understand how much God loves you, watch now what happens when they repent. That's how God responds. Joel 2.14 says, who knows whether he will not turn and relent. And leave a blessing behind him. Folks, turn and relent. That's what we call mercy. Mercy is God withholding from us wrath that we deserve. And then leave a blessing behind him. That's called grace. Grace is his pouring out on us goodness that we don't deserve. In other words, in mercy and grace, we don't get what we do deserve. And we get what we don't deserve. Wow. So, if you break into my house and steal my stuff, and I catch you, and I don't call the police, that is called mercy. I am withholding from you the trouble you deserve. But if I go on from there to say, well, obviously, you're in financial need, and I, I'll just write you a check then for $10,000 and take a little pressure off. That's grace. And by the way, don't try that. I'll call the cops. I'm not God. I'm not that merciful or gracious, okay? Did you see the distinction there between mercy and grace? God not only wants to shield his wrath from you, he wants to return blessing and prosperity to your life. Look at verse 19 of Joel 2. (coughs) The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. That word satisfied means contentment. Folks, what is the greater blessing for God to dump stuff on your life? In other words, give you a lot of stuff or to enable you to be happy with what he's given you already. 
Contentment is probably a greater gift than any of the grain or the wine or the oil. Contentment is learning to be happy in him regardless of what you have. Parents, isn't this what we're trying to teach our kids? Aren't we trying to teach our kids you don't need every new version of every new toy in order to be happy? Contentment is a quality that is a character. It's not a condition to how, of how much stuff you have. Contentment has more to do with your character than it does the amount of your possessions. So sometimes God will bless you with more stuff. Most of the time, he will give you greater contentment in the stuff you already have. Sometimes God will bless you by taking away the pain. But most of the time, he'll give you joy and peace beyond the pain. He goes on. This might be my favorite one. Joel 2.25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. Retroactive restoration. I, I don't know that there's ever been any other expression of grace like this. God will go back and make up for what sin has destroyed in your life. Sometimes you will experience that on earth, probably not often. Other aspects, and most of the time, you won't experience until you get to heaven. But let me tell you about Job. Job went through it, didn't he? First few chapters tell all the things that Job went through. But two little verses at the end of the book say that God multiplied so that he had seven times more at the end than he did at the beginning. God says, I will restore what the locusts have eaten. Sometimes that will happen on earth. Other times you will not experience it till you get to eternity. I, I just ask, and we're just about through for the, those that are doing the music. But I just ask, what has sin destroyed in your life? Has divorce hurt your heart or your family? Or have you, just made this, uh, have you just made decisions that you think mess up your life beyond repair? Have you made decisions where you say, why can't I go back and talk to the 19-year-old version of me? Or why can't I talk, go back to that 30-year-old version of me and say, don't do that. And you feel that pain of despair because you feel like you've lost something you're never going to get back. Return to me, says the Lord, and I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. Translation, your life is not over. If you return to God, he promises that all you went through is going to be swallowed up in goodness. It's a res restoration, folk, that will last forever. When you've been there 10,000 years and you're bright shining as the sun, you've no less days to sing the glories of God's grace than the moment you first begun. See, that will free you from despair. It will free you from bitterness. Folks, if you are in Christ, nobody has ever taken from you what God will not restore in abundance in eternity. I'm going to close. Go back to the beginning of the book. Joel 1, 3 says, tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. So what, what happened to all that wrath of God? What happened to all those hordes of locusts? Throughout the book, Joel keeps referring to this coming day of the Lord. The day of the Lord that God will pour his judgment on earth. And it says on that day, the sun will be darkened. The moon will be turned to blood. The earth will quake. Folks, remember when Jesus was crucified? Literally on that day, many of those things happened. The sun was darkened. The earth shook. The hordes of locusts of God's wrath devoured lots of things. And Paul said the good news of that is that the judgment dimension of the day of the Lord has passed. And all that remains for those in Christ is the resurrection, the restoration, and the reconciliation. Do you catch this? The first sermon ever preached. After Jesus was raised from the dead, the text was Joel chapter 2.
Read this little book again. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word and how powerful your word is. It's amazing to get the picture of our mind of these locusts that are just devouring everything in their path. They're so thick that you can't even see the sun, that the earth becomes dark. And it's, a, it's such a warning of judgment. It's such a warning and an illustration of what sin can do in our life. It can just devour it. And we've seen those effects in, in other people's lives, and we don't want them in our own. So, Father, I pray that as just as Joel, Joel warned those people that they need to repent, that we might be found doing that today. That we might say to you that your presence and your power are the most important things in my life and actually mean every word that we say. Father, help us in our minds or actually in our bodies to get down on our knees before you and beg you to help us live a life that is pleasant in your sight. We don't need to be rich. We don't need to be famous. We don't need to be healthy. We just need to be yours. So help us to find Jesus and simply never let go of him. We ask this in his name. Amen.